Hello and welcome back to Down the Slope. Ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, we did it! We 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 played Hearts at the weekend. I think it's fair to say we absolutely battered them and we won one nil. I, I think one nil was a was a bit kind to Hearts. I thought we put, put a, a really good performance. But we've got four very happy chappies on uh, tonight. Ryan, we'll come to you first. How you doing, mate? Couldn't be better, mate. Could not be better. Superb. Uh, Greg, yourself, mate. How you getting on? Yeah, not bad, mate. Yourself. Mate, I'm delighted. And and Liam, just before we get on to the thing that made me potentially most happy about the weekend, Liam, how are you doing? I'm doing really good, mate. I like uh, you said there were four really happy chappies at the start there, and then there was like one person with positive body language, and now three just fucking sitting there like, <laughs> can we get on, mate? <laughs> oh, but just before we get on to the proper part of the podcast, as it was mentioned and revealed to us all last week, um, you you had missed you had missed the game at the weekend, and Liam, can we just reflect on why? Because it makes me smile every time because it's so fun. <laughs> um, so you had the choice between going to the derby or uh, going to see Charlie in the Chocolate Factory at the theatre, um, and him and his uh, his his partner Lauren, I think went. And I think they were the the only two adults there without any children. I've heard unconfirmed reports um, that they were. They were being watched because they were the, without a child at a children's uh, theatre show. Um, and uh, I missed the, missed, missed the derby. Um, so he's missing tonight's episode, I think. I, I think in, in large part just because uh, he didn't want to face the music, to be honest. Greg, oh, we'll come on to the game soon, but talk, talk to me about that moment of, of you and missing Hibs when I came at Easter Road. <laughs> um, it's absolute ammunition for a long time, isn't it? Um, also, from my sources, heard that you got a wee, uh, you got a wee tub of ice cream at the interval, uh, which is cute. So, um, yeah, I mean, he's made an absolute shot front of himself doing that, but there we go. You know, he's going to have to face the consequences now. He, he did, he did say when you've done that derby preview. I don't know if you remember that, Harry and Ryan, but he did say he, he, he sensed that come Saturday at two fifteen, he'd rather have been at the theatre than watching abs. So. And Ryan, you, you can end us off and then we'll actually get into the, the crux of the episode. Um, it's just so funny, isn't it? Yeah. So back to this challenge the chocolate factory, man. Like, it's so good. Yeah, so initially, <laughs> initially I thought I was brought into this podcast to kind of cover for uh, for Liam with the arrival of young Neve, But it appears I've been brought in to replace you and since you started to to go to theatre and, and critique shows uh, on a weekly basis. So I think that was the first one. I think he's got Hamlet next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, he's, he's writing uh, theatre reviews in the Falkirk Foghorn uh, from, from next week. Uh, the local paper up in Falkirkshire. <laughs> Mate, next thing you at a football game, instead of man on, he's going to shout, he's behind you! <laughs> <laughs> Be honest, Harry, how many days have you been keeping that? Mate, I just came up with that a second ago. I wanted to know how to work it out. Uh, oh, mate, honestly, that is sensational. Um, but guys, okay, Ewan, um, he, he did actually enjoy himself at the weekend. And of course, he's happy that Hibs won, but let's actually get into it. Guys, talk talk to me about the weekend. Um, one thing we always do after after a special moment like Saturday, we always kind of reflect on the moments that were kind of personal to us that, you know, like on, on those days, you always have that moment where you look back and you think, that was quality. Like for me, um, see after the goal it is honestly the highest I've ever jumped in my life like you know when you land after jumping and you're like I, I land and I was like oh my god I was fucking high up there like my knees were above my head I jumped that high when the goal went in <laughs> Ryan was there any like moment in particular you're looking back on the weekend and you're like that was just class um, yeah there was a few obviously uh, sunshine on leaf with my people all around around about me but uh, the goal um surprised that one of the people that sits next to us is still breathing um, so there's a young lad I don't know if he listens to the podcast but he kind of he sits in the last seat before the TV gantry and then there's Brody Lee Leo myself and we Shaga uh, and when the goal went in I don't know why but we all flooded towards him and he was crushed up against the TV gantry and like I tried to break free a couple of times to go mad and I couldn't like I don't know who had a hold of me but it was a fucking bear hug um, it was just scenes wild Wild. Unreal, man. Liam, talk to me. What, what special moment did you take away from Saturday? That boy, yeah, the boy that Ryan describes, he's he's literally, like, we, we are pretty, we're quite a, I would say we're quite a cam bunch of the football, particularly at home games, and uh, we didn't really jump about that much, but he's been there for the Rangers equaliser, the Derby equaliser, and, of course, the winning Derby there this season. Oh. So I think he probably thinks that we're, like, this bunch of, like, 
slightly sort of schizophrenic people who just didn't really enjoy going to the football and then all of a sudden go absolutely fucking mental at certain moments and he, he ends up getting crushed to death or being about three rows in front of himself. He's a good lad. Um, I'm trying to come one that's a bit unique. I mean, I don't really have any. There's a funny one uh, and people who know him will appreciate this because there's, there's a guy that we see, I've seen him like genuinely dozens and dozens of times at home in away games and he always feels need to introduce himself to me every time I speak to him even though I know his name and I've known him for years. Um but he was he was picking uh, he w- walk, walking up Easter Road with him for the game and turned around to, to my mate Brody who was dressed with his black sunglasses on and his I think it was navy rather than black long coat on and asked him if he was Tommy B. Jones out of the men in black and it's just one of those like things. It's not funny if you didn't ken him, but it's just funny because it's Brody. Uh, uh, aye, so the men in black, big Tommy Lee Jones was at the game, uh, for anyone who didn't see him on Saturday. Sensational, and Greg. Obviously, you took it in with your granddad. How how special was that? Yeah, look, it's um, it always is to be honest. It's like he, he he gets quite emotional with Sun Suyanli from that, which which is obviously it's an emotional song. But yeah, listen, it was it was good just to see the moment. Obviously, the goal as well. Um, he's eighty six, but he can still fucking jump about that. <laughs> um, and then I I suppose it. it a lot of it was a relief of scoring, to be fair, because I felt like it was maybe going to be one of those days. Um, and then you just sort of like hug everyone around you and it just becomes a bit pandemonium, e- even in the West Upper, by the way, before anyone <laughs> makes a comment. Oh, I know. I, I go to the games like at the weekend just because of a rearranged time. There ended up only being three of us instead of the usual five hours an hour end. But um, Bex and Craig accidentally exchanged blows. So Bex has got a bump on the side of her head and Craig's got like a red mark on his jaw. Because when they were like went to hug each other, they both like smacked each other. It was class. Um, but that's what it's all about. It's about the daft stuff. But yeah, um, as always with the episodes, we always get um fired straight into listener questions. So um we'll come up with Jack Kelly. We've got a few for us, but we'll get we'll get into them. Um so looking ahead, as opposed to the weekend, looking ahead, uh, would you start the same team um that we started against Hearts against St Johnston obviously played brilliantly and don't change a winning team but just feels a bit too defensive against St Johnston um, and his opinion and um, what what do we think we have a few like that so let's let's tackle that straight away from from the lineup that started at the weekend would you make any changes or would you keep it the same for the sake of consistency oh, I'd, I'd probably be looking to keep it the same to be honest um would probably bring Cam Mullen for Jago uh, but I think the way that, that Doyle Hayes I knew we were playing, they weren't playing as holding midfield players as maybe what it looked like when the team came out. So I'd maybe change them, um, but I thought, I think if one point is I have to keep their place in the team, um, will come as no surprise that I don't really think Jimmy Jago affected the game as much. Um, but yeah, I, I would probably bring Campbell in for him, um, but other than that, I wouldn't be changing anything. Um, yourself, Liam? You seem to be in Same agreement. team. Same team. Even Jago for yourself, or would you look to... Ah, uh, no, same team. Just keep the same team. Okay. Ryan, any disagreements? Are you happy with that? No, nah, I mean, I, th- I think it would be quite harsh for anybody to drop out, uh, especially the magnitude of the game. Uh, and they all they all turned up on the day. So, yeah, they deserve to keep their places. I'm going to make a quick comment, and Greg and Liam aren't allowed to comment on it, but we're going to quickly run away from it. Um, I think that Jago, I, I think first half, I don't think he was very good. I thought second half it was probably the best we've seen of Jago, in my opinion. I think that he put himself quite about quite well, a, a bit. He put himself about quite well, and I think he actually done his job for a change. So I was happy with him second half. Um, so for me personally, I'd also keep the same team. But Is this a new few... type of podcast when we're not allowed any discourse when people say things. Hey, we just, no, we just are. It's just here. we've we've made oh, we've okay. made our opinions clear on Jago, and I just don't want to accidentally right, open a cool. can of worms. And can can I say one Jago. thing on for Saturday? Yeah, yeah, course, yeah. thought about him. Um, I think Jago to an extent on Saturday, the things that we've praised him for, he did badly, and the things we've criticised him for, he did better. So I thought his actually his passing was better than it's mm. been, but he was he was two yards off the pace for me, yeah, pretty much the whole game. Fair, fair. Um, and then more some some fun, fun questions from Jack Kill, and we'll do them. We'll do each year. So Liam, we'll go through you first. He's got three music questions. It's just either or. Can you or Kendrick? Kendrick. Um, Oasis or Arctic Monkeys? Oasis. And Radiohead or the Smiths? The Smiths and Ryan will come to you. Can you, Kendrick? I'm on the same three as Liam. Oh, fair. Um, Greg, any different? 
Uh, I have the monkeys for Oasis. Ooh, ooh, Smash Radiohead. Mm, tough one. Morris is a bit of a, a super, so uh, <laughs> uh, stick, we'll, we'll stick. We'll stick with the Smiths. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, as well. <laughs> see the thing is, see if, if Kanye <laughs> didn't have his antics in the last year or so, I'd, I'd very con- uh, confidently say Kanye. I think he's, Kanye's, um, like, he's a absolutely. Uh, he's away with a goalie. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> Yeah. Can't can, 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 can hand out to Matt Letizia fucking flyers at the end of the day. Can we ask him which he would choose? Oh, guys. Either the Smiths, either can you? Oh, I've like jogged like a bit bloody half a mile to get to the game in that. And then as I'm jogging around the stadium, I just see a big banner and it's um, vaccine genocide. As I'm trying yeah, to walk into East Road, I was like, what is going on? So they were there before the game as well. They were right. Get them, get them banned for Easter Road. Whoever can ban them, well, get listen, them gone. P- people have their own views, but it's Derby Day, so do you know what I mean? Oh. Stay at like, the road. Probably like Ross County or Home or something that can be a bit more entertaining. But uh, so down, 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 the slope, down the slope of the podcast, it welcomes all views except from the views of those who praise Jimmy Jack. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. Mm. Um, but we're yeah, not thank really you. though. <laughs> yeah, thank you Jack Kell for your question next we're going to go to the HFC way and I'm looking forward to the answers here boys um, do you think Jake Doyle Hay- Hayes played well on Saturday Greg we'll come to you first how how did you rate Jake Doyle Hayes' performance you know what? no he didn't play well he was outstanding absolutely phenomenal performance you know he was he done everything he was pressing he was tackling he was playing nice nice passes um he done everything to be honest. He was probably my man of the match, to be honest, between him and him and Joe Newell. Very, very close, but I thought he was he was superb. Obviously we'd seen him against Motherwell, he was he was pretty shit, but but on Saturday he was, he was unbelievable. And Ryan, if you could build on that, I know you were really impressed with Jake Doyle Hayes at the weekend. What will we seen from him in this game that we've maybe not seen from him in the last few? Yeah, I think if you refer back to the the pre Derby podcast, I uh, alluded to the fact that off the ball was one of the biggest elements of football, and it'd be massive on this game. Um, and I think Jake Doyle he's done everything that that you know was needed in that game in terms of pressing. Uh, he knew how to press, when to press. He won the ball back on numerous occasions. He initiated the uh, you know the team getting up the park. He was good on the ball. I think he was just so wiry and determined throughout the game. He won back possession so many times, started counter-attacks. He, he was just a man possessed. I mean, he must have been dripping with sweat because he covered every blade of grass, I'm telling you. Yeah, no, I, th- I, th- I think, as, as you said about the press, I just I thought he was really good. I, th- I think he seemed the most energetic player in the field. It's not really a side to Jake Doyle Hayes, I think we've seen before. Um, I've seen a few people like Leon, um, a good friend of the pod, he said that he thinks that's Jake Doyle Hayes' best game. I'd probably be inclined to agree. I think that if mm-hmm. he can fulfil that role that he did pick up at the weekend, I don't think we've seen from him before. I think there's there's a space in the starting lineup for him every week. I, I don't think um, that can be disputed. I think a few of us have said it for long enough that he's not been played in his right position. Saturday was his right position, maybe a little bit further, further up the pitch, and, and you've seen how good he was and he affected the game massively. You know, he was winning tackles. He was he was holding possession. He was playing passes. He was doing everything that, that you'd expect the midfielder to be doing. But he was doing it so well. Done, done the, done the fundamentals to a very high standard, really. And just to build on that, Liam, man, we've got a question <coughs> from Paul Mackay, um, who said, Neil and Jake Doyle Hayes, if they can play like that against Hearts, why hasn't it worked at previous times? What what did you see in this game that we might not have seen when they've played together before? They were both playing that sort of pivot role in front of the centre-backs, I think, when they've played together most typically. Um, and I'm not sure that's either of their strongest position, but it's certainly more of a strength for Neil than it is for Doyle Hayes. You, you, you were right, Harry, it's a very different type of performance from what we've seen from Doyle Hayes, but I think that demonstrates that he's maybe a bit more of a Swiss Army knife than we thought he was. Uh, people thinking he was just really a deep lion sort of a guy that was going to take the ball off the set of halves and that's all he could do, and I think his game's about a lot more than that, but it's good that the manager spotted it, because um, it's something that I think quite a few fans have been calling for for a while, for to play a bit forward, effectively kind of playing almost the Josh Campbell role of this season, you know, being the, the guy that sets the press and forces the 
course of their centre half to play it long. Um, it was great picking up second balls and stuff like that in midfield as well. And on Saturday, lost lost count particularly in the first half. The number of second balls he managed to either disrupt or managed to get on. Um, it was it was a different, more combative type performance. But I I I think I think it can work if both of them are playing a little bit more advanced. And you know, this is where we come into where you know the likes of a Jimmy Jago or someone else that plays that position being beneficial to the team because it allows our footballers to play a bit higher up. Um, and then just moving on, I'm sure we'll talk about Jake Doyle here at some other point in the pod. Um, Cammy McEwen has asked, he's got a couple of questions. Um, he said, now the dust has settled and what was undoubtedly a fantastic result and performance, do you think it paints over the cracks of recent weeks? Um, is that kind of covering up from other poor performances or is it kind of hopefully the swinging pendulum back to form after maybe dipping in form? Yeah, I mean, hopefully it's... On you go, Greg. We've been pretty volatile all season in terms of form. We've not really been able to keep a, a steady run of form going. Um probably makes it more frustrating that you see that level of performance and effort for, for the team that you've maybe not seen in the recent weeks, but I don't think it papers over the cracks. I think you know you almost know what the squad's capable of, but when they don't produce it, it becomes a, a real frustration. We have had runs this season, though. We've had runs. Like we've had runs of good and then runs of shit um, and very little in between. I don't know about you, but it feels like we've hardly drawn any games this season. Oh, it feels like we've been on winning runs and losing mental. runs. Like, yeah. uh, And I don't really feel that there's been much of an in-between with this team. You know, we've lost four in a row and won. <clears> I would suggest that the form book shows that based on our performances and if he was to keep the same team, I would suggest likelihood is that we go on a winning run now. But obviously it depends on how the fixtures fall after the Top six after the split. We've only drawn four games this season, which is pretty <laughs> wild. Fucking hell. Yeah, that's mental. Fucking hell. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is wild. Like, I, because I remember there being a season where I can't remember how many years it's going back now. Maybe Heckenbottom, where we'd drawn, lost, and won just about yeah. the same number of games uh, at the end of the season. It was like 13 or 14 draws. Um, yeah, we're, we're, the, we're the third joint, third lowest. Aberdeen have drawn two, and Celtic have drawn one. So. Yeah, but probably because we've not really seen that in between, it's probably been more frustrating because it has either mainly drawn or winning games. Sometimes yeah. that papering over the cracks comment, Harry. Yeah, I think I think what maybe what what he's alluding to there is, I think the the, the spirit after a win in the derby lifts like around the club, and a, a spirit a, a win after every big game lifts, and it maybe for some fans who think quite short term. It makes you just reflect on being grateful for the derby when you perhaps you forget about some of the shortcomings. But I think that's for, for me that's a that points to a bit of a lack in I think a lack in standards to be honest. Standards of both the club and the fan base. Like actually we should be winning that game, but we should now be focusing very much on building on that straight away and not just allowing that us to bask in the win of a derby game for too long. Because ultimately, the performances against one Motherwell and Dundee United were completely unacceptable. You know, we've won one game. Now we need to lift it. Sorry, I didn't mean to try and bring no, this down. No, it's no. a negative. I just, I, I think we do need to. I think we do need to not rest on our laurels. Yeah, no, I, I, I think but, that's fully valid. Um, Ryan, I'll, I'll come to you next because I know um you tried to get in at the start. Um, but the second part of Cammy's question was, um, do you think we can kick on from the derby when I'm finishing the top four? Um, or like, well, there, there's a few people that have sent in, and um, Green Rivers also sent in. Do you think we'll turn up on Saturday against St Johnston? So, I'll, I'll I'll slightly tweak their question. So, one, how huge a game is this for Hibs at the weekend against St Johnston away? And given the win on Saturday, do you think this Hibs team will show up in this game at the weekend in Perth? Um, I think Saturday now turns into our biggest game of the season, based off what what's at stake for us. You know, obviously the derby was massive, but we need to move on to the next one. As Liam says, you can't bask in that. Everything that we want is at stake here. And I would hope that based off the reaction that the fans gave the players at full time on Saturday, that they'll take that up to Perth with them and realise, you know, what it is for the club to finish in the top six and then fight for Europe thereafter. Um, In terms of papering over the cracks, for me personally, I mean, it doesn't make me forget about the poor performances away to Dundee United at home at Motherwell at various other points of the season. Um, hopefully it's just a catalyst to kick on. And Greg, Greg or 
Yeah, no, we've got a great next. We've got a great next. Um, what what are you thinking? Um, how how confident are you for this game? Obviously, um, it's came out now that Callum Davidson's been sacked by St Johnston. So second week in a row, we're playing a game without uh, the opposition team having a manager. And um, do you think that gives Hibs an advantage in this one, or do you think it will give them a bit of a rock up the arse and make them come out fighting? We need to focus on ourselves. Um, there's no point in focusing on what St Johnston are doing, who's in charge, who's not in charge, whatever. We need to focus on ourselves. Uh, and Ryan's spot on. It is the biggest game of the season now. You know, Saturday's already good, but if you don't back it up this weekend, it means nothing ultimately. If you, if you don't finish in this top six, it means nothing. You know, there's no point hoping that somebody will do us a favour. Let's just go out and do our own job, focus on our own, own performance and make sure we get the win and then we don't need to rely on anyone else. And we can, that's another win. That's two in a row. You can start building on that. I think we, we need to stop focusing on what everyone else is doing and focus on ourselves. Yeah. Um, and Liam, uh, um, unfortunately, I, I can't justify coming up every week to go to Hibs games, but I, I believe you've managed to uh, get make free up the time as such um, to get yourself to Perth at the weekend. How how excited are you for that game? Or do you reckon come Saturday morning you'll be shitting it? I, I don't think you'll be shitting it. I, I mean, it's a big game, certainly, in the context of our season. Um We've been there once already. There was a season we had a great day out and opening day of the season there already, uh, which we very much enjoyed in the sunshine. I'm hoping the weather similar on Saturday. And to be honest, I, I, I do think I, I do think there's a bit more steel about this team. I know the last four results at the Derby haven't been good, but I think there's a bit more steel about this team since the end of January. So I'm hopeful that we can go up there and get a result. I actually also have a sneaking feeling, I probably shouldn't say this because it's chance of it getting clipped but I also have a real sneaky feeling that Dundee United will beat Livingston on Saturday anyway um, they have turned a corner massively and Livingston need to win the game because the goal difference is sufficient so I take Greg's point about focusing on ourselves and he's right we do need to focus on ourselves and we need to go and win the game but I've got a feeling that we might be done a bit of a favour anyway on Saturday um, and then looking back to the weekend, so we're going to jump about back and forth. You know how we do. Um, but Tony Swanson has sent in um, brilliant performance and excellent team commitment by everyone involved. Huge passion. I found myself a couple of times picking on Cadden for a couple of slips where he was beat too easy. My question, do we focus too much on individual errors and make our mind up about players? Um, I'll I'll start on this one because I'm not starting on one tonight. Um, I, th- I think most football fans, including myself, are guilty of kind of pre-setting agendas against players. Um, realistically, Chris Cadden was fucking excellent at the weekend. Um, I've seen a lot of people complaining about his crosses. Chris Cadden was up and down that wing relentlessly. He put them under so much pressure. Him and Doyle Hayes were playing one twos for fun. He put a lot of good balls in the box. It's not necessarily his fault that strikers don't attack them. Um, Tony, this isn't a rant at you. It's just in general. Um, but I've seen a lot of people being like Cadden was. Cadden was very, very good. Um, and if you, in my opinion, if you're looking at it from a person that wants them to do well, you shouldn't have seen that as a bad performance from Cadden. Personally, um, like if you ask Craig who I go to the gate, who I went to the game with, um, he'll tell you I I had an agenda against you. I go at the start of the game, I, I turned it off at halftime, and I thought he'd done pretty well. But I, I think we do all have our pre biases going into football games. But personally, I'm not taking Cadden slander after that. Cadden was at least an eight out of ten. I thought he was very good. Um, what what do you guys think? Do you think that football fans or Hibs fans in general can kind of come into games um already so the bias is a fact of life yeah. like it's mm-hmm. it's not it's not something which is specific to football fans or fans yeah. in any sport um we all have things that we we look for in players I, I i'm very open and very clear that one of the things that's very prob- probably number one for me is just work rate is is absolutely number one for me and um, mm-hmm. everything else comes secondary to that um if the player works hard generally i'll 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 find a place in my heart for him there's a lot of biases which we have, which are also we're not conscious of that happen that we watch football through the lens of. You know, there's been stuff, loads of studies done on players of different ethnicities and how they're viewed. You know, black players are always talked about as being kind of athletic, strong, and powerful, um, when actually they're never never talked about in terms of their football IQ. To use a term that our manager uses, for example, um, so I think there's there's, there's biases of course, and then there's some very a different thing which is very clear agendas and some people in our fan base have very clear agendas for and against certain players some players come in for undue amounts of criticism I think and other players come in for undue amounts of praise just because of an agenda that someone has or an argument that they feel like they want to win and I'll be honest I, sometimes I do push the agenda of certain players because it suits me to do so um, but that's just that's just life eh? like 
but you maybe do that unconsciously. You can sometimes do that unconsciously as well, of course. I think um, for me, I've always had one against Paul Hanlon for long enough. But then, <laughs> see, see, but assuming you actually look at it, he's he's been so good for us this season. I would say, I mean, mm-hmm. you notice a difference when Mel Fish is playing beside him. He looks so much more comfortable. The experience that Hanlon has, you can you, you just know that Fish enjoys playing alongside him because we're much better when they two play together. And on the Cadden thing, actually, I'd be more concerned if, if, if my winger, maybe after a couple of not, not so great crosses or crosses that didn't hit our target, stopped, try to cross, but he doesn't, he doesn't shy away. He continues to try and put the ball in the box in an area where people can attack it. I don't want my football players to hide. I want my players to, to continue doing what they're doing, to continue doing their job, and to, to be there ready to receive the ball when when they're there. So I certainly don't I don't think that Cadden should be getting criticised because he certainly didn't hide at the weekend. I think we've been guilty in, in this team of some people hiding, but he's never been one of them, no matter what. He's always been there. He's always looking for the ball. He's always looking to get forward. He's never had in this team once at all, ever. Um. And Ryan, I'll, I'll come to you first on the next question. So, Paul, we, we asked this one about uh, Doyle, Hayes and Newell together. He also asked, um, if Joe Newell was more consistent, would he be at Hibs? Um, I'm just going to tweak that slightly. Um, just how good was Joe Newell at the, at the weekend? Like, what on earth was that? That, In my opinion, that, that minute for minute is by far the best we've seen out of Joe Newell at Hibs. Yeah, um, again, I'll refer back to the podcast with P. Derby and, and Ewan said that we were kind of missing that Joe Neal performance in the Derby over the years and he was hoping that he would turn up and Jesus Christ did he turn up. He was unbelievable. I know I've waxed lyrical about Jake Doyle Hayes, but Joe Neal was just as good uh, in, in different ways. His use of the ball was phenomenal. Again, he also won possession back on, on many occasions. He's got great feet in tight areas and his work rate was unbelievable, which is... Bare minimum, but you know what? He done it, and he done it for ninety. Well, he came off towards the end of the game, but he done it until he came off. He worked hard, and um, he was really impressive. Uh, just head, he looked head and shoulders above any Hearts player on that pitch. He dominated the midfield. Yeah, but I, I think I think we need to just have a bit of wax and lyrical about Joe Newley. Was that good? Talk talk to me about Joe. How how did he make you feel, Greg? <laughs> um, proud. Uh, nah, look. Uh, he was flying at the tackles. He was uh, he was distributing the ball well. He, he just done everything that, that you'd expect from from a midfielder in a derby. He didn't give them a minute. He was he was being extremely annoying, and that's what you need. You need someone just to be an absolute bastard in the middle of the park. And you know he won the ball. He was spraying passes, but he was also doing the dirty side of the, the game. You know, he, a few tackles, um, pulling players back on the break, like. You know, we we've not really had we've not really done that in a derby. You know, and I feel like I feel like Hearts always do that. We beat them at their own game. You know, we were horrible at the weekend, absolutely horrible. And it's good to see because you need you need to be an absolute pass in a derby. No point in turn up and being nice and showing too much respect. I, th- I thought Junio was absolutely phenomenal to be honest. And people can say what they want about Junio, but he's another one that never hides. He always wants to get on the ball and drive forward. He's never want to hide. And Liam, just I think it's fair to say out of anybody on the pod, I've probably been the most critical of Joe Newell. Um, but I, one one thing that really impressed me at the weekend, I, I thought that was the biggest like that's the most we've seen him like a leader in the team. I felt that as as Greg touched on and Ryan touched on, I felt that he really helped drive the team forward and his attitude as well. Uh, he got subbed off, and then there was a scrap on the pitch, and he was off the bench about trying to scrap with everybody. Um, do you think that attitude was a big contributing factor to Joe Newell's performance at the weekend? Maybe, maybe I genuinely think Joe Neal has a good game in Derby. It's like I'm not sure that I would agree with you in the sentiment that he needed to turn up. I think certainly both the 0 games last season, I thought he was one of, if not our best player. Um, I struggle to remember. I think he normally has a good game against Rangers as well. So I'm not sure I agree with the assertion that he's a good game. I think I have to say from Joe Newell is he's a guy about 29, 30 years of age. For me, he needs to be playing that nine times out of 10. His level needs to be at a standard where he doesn't just produce that one in every three or four games, he needs to produce that eight, nine, ten, 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 eight or nine times out of ten. Um, and I don't think he does it regularly enough. 
for me to hold him in the esteem that I should hold him because I think he's got the ability to be a proper, you know, when we're naming lifetime elevens, I think he's got the ability to be a guy who's in that conversation. I just don't think he produces it enough. But just, but just, just so we can turn it into a positive twang. Um, but how good was he? Um, that is a positive what, twang. He's got uh, the ability. He's got yeah, the, yeah, but, yeah. But the ability. He was, uh, he was brilliant. He, I, I mean, I can't really add anything to, to what Greg and Ryan have said about his specific performance on Saturday because he, 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 all, all the, all the key things that you would, you would, you would want to, you'd want to talk about have been discussed. But I, I just, I, I, I think the ability of the player is just, it's, 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 it's him, him in that midfield up against probably every single midfielder in the league outside uh, Celtic and Rangers, he's got the ability to be the best midfielder on the pitch. Aye. And he was on Saturday, probably. Just ahead of Doyle Hayes. Just. Maybe. I'd, 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 agree with him. I'd agree with that. Um, but just uh, coming, coming to my favourite question of the week, it came in uh, from Lee Rose, absolute legend, what a boy. Um, and, he, and he said, if blood not showing on a maroon jersey is a sign of toughness, how big a worry is shite showing on white shorts? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant to see him finally bully them for 90 minutes, kind of following on from what Greg said there. Um, yeah, it was it was good. We were, we were in their face. We were constantly badgering them. Um, we had the Egan Riley... Uh, Absolute slamming into McKay or Mackay, and then we had Campbell. Who was it? The Campbell clattered at the end. I can't remember, but it was a fair whack. Like, ah, oh, it was beautiful, but it's so nice because, like, typically across the years, we beat like when we beat Hearts. I remember the Harry Cochrane foul on John McGinn. Like, they've always had the nasty bastard tackles, and we don't really do that in derbies. But it was nice to see Hibs actually get stuck in amongst it, wasn't it? Hundred percent, but and that that is probably what has been missing in the derbies over the last couple of years. I think Greg said it earlier, you really need to be a bastard in those games. You have got to be a horrible bastard to play against. Because I, th- I think the Why thing is, is... Why is Campbell getting booked, by the way? It's not a booking. It's a 50-50. No, it is. It's not yeah. a booking. But Devlin should have been sent off. He's not being shattered. Aye. And just, just whilst we're on that, how can Shanklin fucking maul down Marshall and not even get booked? H- how? Like, it's stop- insane. See if it's in any other area of the pitch. It's stopping a counter attack because Marshall was going to mm-hmm. launch it. Like it is ridiculous. Yeah. Um. Then one one other question. It was something Beck's messaged last week, and I don't think we discussed it in too much depth. Um. After the weekend, how do you feel about Naismith with Hearts for the rest of the season? Being honest, I I, I think Hearts looked about as bad as we've seen them at Easter Road. I don't think they were set up very well at all. Um. I know they've lost a few in a row and they've kind of lost to the top of the league and the bottom of the league. Um, I think it'll be an interesting game. Um, there's a lot of pressure riding on that game. It's on TV and stuff. But Ross County need a win, especially with Dundee United picking up form. Um, what what do you guys think of Hearts? I, I think at the moment Hearts are looking down as opposed to up and I think that's a good thing for Hibs. Yeah, I hope he stays. I, I really hope he stays at Hearts. <laughs> uh, he's got this kind of fantasy to try to play football out from the back it seems you know split the centre half school he plays it out to Sibic they're trying to play through the thirds I mean like it's not going to work man it's not going to work so if, if Hearts continue to play like they did on Saturday they can keep him for five years if they want um, I honestly could not give one flying fuck what Hearts do to be honest um, but mm, the style of football is absolutely dreadful basically Xander Clark passed out to Sibic so it runs ten yards and shells it all the way to Marshall. Like do that all day if you want, lad. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, Stephen Naismith. I've, I've never really liked him. Play for the clubs he's played for, Alan Everton. But he's, aye, ah, he's just a wee dick. Absolutely. Like you know, I, I don't know what Nisbet's celebration was, but I'm guessing it was aimed at him. Aye, I heard a wee rumor about that, but I'll not talk about that in the podcast. Man, That's the kind of shite housery I'm talking about. We need more <clears> of that, man. Absolutely. Listen, listen, they do it to us, so... 100%. You know I mean? uh, Naismith sat there in his seat. <laughs> my face like a scalped ass. <laughs> you know, he came out after the game and he was moaning about stuff and saying they've never spoke about third. He's kidding himself on if they've never spoke about third. Absolutely just, kidding himself on. See, just on the Naismith weekend, he said that we played long the whole game. He's fucking deluded. Uh, and to be honest, listen, we might have went direct a couple of times, but I tell you, we played more football than they did. 
I think we did play long, but I think we effectively played yeah, long because every every yeah. single time the ball bounced near Kyrie Rose, he had a aneurysm. I've never seen a boy it's panic at a ball bouncing so much in my life. So the definition of long balls, eh? You need to get some sort of stat geek to defend, determine what a long <laughs> ball is. But we did knock the ball in behind them a lot over the course of the game. To me, but if you say long ball, it's like an aimless pass that goes through the keeper. Like if you're hitting a long pass and it's somebody who's receiving the ball and keeping possession, it's not just shelling it, is it? Do you know what I mean? Is I think anyone? You, I think there was Absolutely. numerous times where numerous times where we got down down the flanks and, and the final ball though um was less than impressive at times. But I think I, I think we played more football than what we're maybe been giving credit for. Um, I don't think the stats tell the full story of the game. Um Your they, eyes might lot, they might have had a lot of possession, but they've done absolutely nothing with it. They can knock it out of the back and then shell it for all I care. Do that all day if you want, but I didn't really see a lot of football from Hearts, to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, the midfield is full of very limited football players, to be honest. So, so what can we expect? Does anyone remember uh, Lee Van Howe's uh, fucking rant about when Big Sam called uh, Lee Van Howe's my A team, a long ball team, and Lee Van Howe turned up to the next press conference with a big fucking massive big leaflet? <laughs> And it had like all the <laughs> all the passes that are played in the games. Like, big Sham, Big Sham call us a long ball team. I'll show you this how many long balls Big Sham's team play. Man United with not a long ball team. Enjoy your mince pie, you fat fuck. <laughs> you like the Sedo Masakism? Like I just uh, it's like I don't um I don't uh, I don't really know what Naismith's getting at with the whole long ball and kind of snobbery thing because Let's be honest, the Hearts teams that you were a part of didn't exactly play sparkling football, did they? Um, he's not really a player that's been synonymous with any club who's played good football. Correct. He's literally remembered for stamping on Scott Brown's back. Like, well done. <laughs> like, oh, I mean, maybe I'll have Darren O'D once as well. Like, great, well done. Good career. Uh, well, st- sticking on, um, well, actually moving on to this weekend, um, Greaves has said, and performance-wise, the standard has been set and it needs to be that way for the game against St Johnston. Um, and then he's followed up with, if we don't finish in the top six, is Lee Johnson back on the chopping block? Essentially, just get, just if, if, Lee, if we lose this game and don't make the top six, in your guys' opinion, does that conversation have to be on the table? We shouldn't be on the chopping block. We shouldn't be at the club if we don't get top six. Has that agreed with yourself as well, Ryan? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, that means we wouldn't have progressed from last season, so the objective has been failed. Um, that, that doesn't mean to say I want him out of the club um, right <clears throat> this minute, but, yeah, that, the goals and aims that we would have had in place for this season would not have been met. And, Liam, you can you, end this off. You're going to let him away with that as an opinion? Are you going to let him away with that or are you, you going to challenge him on no, it? Mate, you, you no, mate, you can't. I don't want him out of the club, but he needs to go if he didn't get top six. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, no, I said right this minute I wouldn't sack him. Oh, I mean, okay. after... Uh, no, um, I mean, fuck. I said yeah. last week. Eh? <laughs> if, 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 I said last week, Gary, he's, if we don't get top six, he's failed on every single objective and therefore he needs to go. I actually listened to a wee bit of... Um, Got Darby Heaver to heads on it last week, and I listened to a wee bit of the Hibs ramble. I think Liam and Sean were talking about it, and um, they they were, I think, very much in the Johnson in camp. So it's always good to hear someone who's got a different perspective from you, first of all, because they're, I think, very much pro Lee Johnson. Um, but what I heard from both of them weren't reasons to keep him, they were reasons not to sack him. So they were talking about things like continuity being important and, and you know making the job attractive and giving someone time. But there wasn't really anything in there for me that was like, here's what he's done and here's why he's demonstrated he should still have the job. So if you're failing every single one of your objectives and you're not really showing a huge number of signs of progress, for me, you need to just go. I would, I would, I would, I would be for emptying him at the end of the season, to be honest, because I don't think there's a huge amount of value in doing it before then. But if we finish bottom six, I, he needs to go for me. Yeah, without asking the point out, uh, I think people will always look to apply for a job regardless of how long managers are in. Uh, and continuity is a word that's branded about a lot. See for me, see if you, uh, if the manager's not performing at the level he should be, then you're not going to get continuity anyway. So there's no point in keeping him, as far as I'm concerned. We've ultimately not, not progressed if we finish in the bottom six. So what's the continuity there? Continuity... 
finishing the bottom six ultimately under two managers. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not having it, to be honest. Yeah. Year on year, there has to be pressure at the club. We finished seventh last year, so we need to finish having that this year. That's the aims and objectives. If they're not met, it needs to go. I think we were eighth last year. Eighth, sorry, sorry. Uh, but no, I, I think, the, I mean, the point stands. I mean, I think, no, no, to hark on about this too much, but I think for me, when you look at, you, you, look, you look at the goals that were probably set at the beginning of the season, it, it, it hasn't really been good enough, especially with the investment and overall. And we're on a real high after the derby and maybe we should just keep it positive. <laughs> so I'm just going to fucking shut up now, Harry. Hi, <laughs> Harry, move us on to some positive. <laughs> on, on. Oh, God. Um, all right, we'll, 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 we'll change up the times, guys. We'll change up the times. So Billy King of the North, he sent in um, 2017-18 league and cup winning development team. Um, from that team, only Fraser Murray, Lewis Allen, Jamie Gullen, Kevin Dabrowski, Sean Mackey, Ollie Shaw and Ryan Porteous made it to the first team. Only Shaw, Campbell and Porteous became regular starters and only Porteous and Shaw um, wait, what? Um, made the club any money. Campbell, the only one still here playing regularly. So my question is, is the current Hibs under-21s are well regarded, but how many will actually go on to play for the first team regularly and who? Um, this team won the league five years ago today, so I thought I'd mix it up and ask the question a bit different from the derby. So essentially, um, out of that team who... Back, back in 2017-18, they were held in very high regard because they pretty much dominated everything they'd done um, and only six of them made an impact and only three of them really made an impact with Porches and Campbell being the only like proper players to develop through Hibs. Um, so just to shorten the question, is there a worry that that same process is kind of happening due to the lack of bleeding through at the first team um, of the current young generation that are doing really well? Anyone who thinks that everyone's going to make it is deluded. They're not all going to make it. They'll, they'll play at different different levels. Gullen's playing the Championship, for example. Um, Kane O'Connor went down to Brentford, uh, now playing at Trident. Um, Kevin Wall won the Lowland League for Spartans. So you've got a whole range of players there. They're not all going to make it. They're not all going to be playing the Hibs first team or playing the top flight in Scotland. It's, it's just not going to happen. Statistically, I think it's what like a very small percentage actually do make it. Yeah, fair. Um, well, I've, 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 uh, Ryan, Liam, I, I don't really have a follow on from that from Greg. I, I feel he's answered that pretty well. But if you guys have got differing opinions, then feel free. No, I don't want to talk about Ocon and Laidlaw again because I think we've done that yeah. like week on week every week. Mm -hmm. But I think your hope would be if you had a really successful team like the one that we've had, that I think the ratio of getting maybe two of them into your first team would be very, very, very good. Like two of them as, as first team players. Um I think, you know, hopefully all of them go on to have successful careers at whatever level of the game. But I think the objective for Hibs has got to be to get players into the first team rather than supply other clubs of first team players. Like selfishly we're here to do well for Hibs. And actually I think that the, the first and foremost thing that needs to be there needs to be some sort of management of that transition from successful development team to first team and I think the club have identified that in fairness so hopefully hopefully we see more of them because like we said you know they, they people generally are more invested in young guys that have come through the system doing well Anything to add on to that Ryan? Uh, not, not too much but I would just kind of be interested if there was kind of a, a name put in place to have at least one uh, academy player on the bench for each game of the season um, you see it happening with big clubs down south, and I think Man United had the record there where they had a, a youth academy graduate in the in the squad at least for years. So what Liam will know better than me, but uh, it was something ridiculous, like six hundred games or something. It was so insane. I mean, is it not still yeah. ongoing? It's still ongoing. I yeah, still I don't. Ongoing. I think since they've started an academy, I think Man, you've always had a player in the team, if I'm not mistaken. So I'd be quite interested if something like that was to happen. One sub. I mean, there is players in in the academy now that even if they're on the bench they're still usable to make an impact in the game so it doesn't take anything away from, from your match day squad so it, interestingly Ryan after uh, after us moaning about it after the uh, what game was it after the Dundee United game we were moaning about there not being any academy players on the bench we beat Hearts and no one's talking about the fact that there wasn't any academy players I know. Bench, <laughs> I know. funny how that works eh? oh, yeah. pickle fans but, but... But uh, following up on that, um, Dave Graham's put in, I've noticed people are now saying bottom six wouldn't mean sack for Lee Johnson. 
not on this pod. Um, is it really <laughs> only about beating hearts? Um, but one one thing I've, I've said a couple of times, um, <laughs> even after Dundee United, I don't know if I said it on the pod or if I just said, said it to me, it's if we beat Lee Johnson, at least for a week, it's going to feel like nothing else matters. Like all is forgiven. Um, realistically, if we go into the bottom six, I think we've all made our t- intentions clear. Like, is it almost silly how much weight we put in the derby. I think that Hibs and Hearts, it's kind of like the, the big rivalries in Scotland. I think that the fans of those clubs put those games maybe in too much esteem because realistically, this this game at the weekend, in terms of like league status, this is a much more important game on paper than the Hearts game is. But just because of the, obviously the passion and stuff that goes into the derby, and um, that's the game that means more to us. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really know how to answer that question. Is it really only about beating Hearts, guys? No. Do you think do you think clubs in Scotland? No, it's not for us. Do you think clubs in Scotland don't place more weight on it because outside the Celtic and Rangers, no one else has really got any opportunity to win anything, or not, or win the league. Like your local rivalry in the league becomes mm. more pronounced because it's bragging rights in a city, and there's a lot of cities in Scotland that are two club cities as well. Yeah, but I think rivalries in a two club city are far more intense. I know people like to bang on about Man United Liverpool, but for me, it's nowhere near as big a light rivalry as some others. Because it's not on one side. So if they're a game season, it's more than just the derbies. The, the derbies are good when you win them, I absolutely. But we've lost two and drawn one this season. So yeah, yeah. Every game has its own importance. We're talking about Saturday being the biggest game of the season, but it wouldn't be had had we not beat Hearts. Mm-hmm. Do, do you know we'd be it would be in a totally different situation? So yeah, every game has its own importance. Um, and then Aki said, considering how many chances we ended up creating, how little hearts created, would we should we be disappointed at the fact we didn't absolutely scalp them? Is there <clears> any regrets lingering at the fact we didn't pump them for three or four? Yeah, obviously you'd want to score more, but you get the same amount of points at the end of the day. So it's their job, Greg. It's their job. <laughs> that was great, that Mike Bassett. That, that was great, Mike Bassett. Like... <laughs> <laughs> that is their job, you know. <laughs> Mm. Bobby said, if they're old enough, they're good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh. Nah, I, 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 I like the, the nature in which we won. Like, oh, by the way, it's not, we've somehow not been asked it, but I've seen it a couple of times on the timeline. When that free kick got given in the 93rd minute, oh, how much no. were you guys shiting? Oh my uh, God, my stomach like, dropped. That was could, horrible. Could I reacted as if like, it was a penalty. Do you know, I felt like, oh, Jesus, this is definitely a goal. We All of us turned round and discussed, like, mm. we're throwing this away. Do you know what I mean? Oh. Yeah. It was like, literally, um, Oz Turk all over, like, we've dominated the whole game. We've got ourselves a one-goal lead, and they're just going to pull a rabbit out in nowhere and end up stealing a point. <laughs> I think that's the, I think that's quite an irrational thing, though, because I think that's an irrational feeling you have just because of the time of the game and mm. the importance of the fixture that we just talked about. Like, yeah. so I was watching that game on telly. It was like a Saturday night and I had no skin in the game. And I'm watching, I don't know, Sampdoria versus Genoa. And Genoa, I've got a free kick there in the 90th minute. I'm going, that's far too close to the goal. Uh, you, how many free kicks do you see that are that close to the goal going the back? Yeah. It's like the, um, the one of my mates was saying to me yesterday, it's like the uh, ones you get in the box um, in direct. Uh, yeah. they, they never go in. It's very difficult. I mean, it's also not score one, though. <laughs> but he was God to be fair so uh, yeah. uh, to, to be fair nine times out of ten they don't go in though just uh, because it's close you know what I mean but no. I know because for that one um, like me Craig and Bex literally just slumped in the seats and then we had to watch it with our what you call it like through through the fingers and then um the what you got people in front of us couldn't they watch so they were watching our reaction so then we, we jumped up yes hits the wall they could turn around yes um so yeah that was that was a very scary I, mean, I don't know why you've been watching this a bit so, yeah I mean, I know, I, I, I've I always put myself through it yeah, it's like when you're watching a horror film no matter how bad it is you always have to see it from some form of angle eh? um but I'm just trying to see if there's any different questions. Um, what do you mean, some sort of angle? I know, but you have to, like, if you're like, oh, Slide no. to the left yeah. of the telly, or... <laughs> are you, are you, are you going to tell him, or am I? Are you going to tell him? You can, you oh. can tell him. Grow up, Harry. Oh! <laughs> absolutely piercing stuff. I've said enough. It's about time someone else did. Yeah, not true. Mm. Um, but yeah, Jeff Jeff Ashton. Um, I want I want to end on a happy question. So I've not I've not worked this round very well. Is Jeff's um, a happy question? Jeff's quite not, a happy not, guy. Like, yeah, Jeff, yeah, Jeff, no, Jeff is Jeff's a happy guy. Is. 
Just, Hello, Jeff. I know it's Jeff. Nice. We all love Jeff. Uh, but Jeff said, does that performance make the performances against Motherwell and Arabs even more annoying? Also, I think that's the first time for a while that we actually played the way that Lee Johnson promised, fast and direct, the opposite to last week. Same again against the tractor. So we don't have to talk about the team. Who did we play um, after Motherwell, Harry? <laughs> well, that's their nickname. <laughs> Do you remember when George, Bush, when George Bush was fighting when they were fighting the, the Iraq war? Um, <laughs> <laughs> he used to call them the Arabs. <laughs> oh, did I just say that? Oh, no. He said the Arabs. <laughs> the Arabs. Oh, he also God. said something which I can't even repeat on the pod because it would get me cancelled to describe people of um, Pakistani and Indian descent. Oh, God. Um, but... And in fairness, since we're talking about um, United States presidents, what about Joe Biden, guys? That was hilarious. That was sensational. <laughs> Mail for Sam. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, back to Jeff, back to Jeff. Um, and also, that is, that is, I, I don't like it as their nicknames, but that's what Dundee United call themselves, so that's what I accidentally said. I meant to call them Dundee United. Um, but does does the performance against Hearts make that a bit more annoying? Obviously, if we'd won either of those games, in theory, if the, everything else stayed the same in life, we would have went above Hearts. So does that make it a bit more irritating? Yeah, it was massively but... frustrating at the time. Uh, and I think in hindsight now, with the benefit of hindsight, it's even more frustrating. But we just need to dust ourselves off and go again Saturday. And, and again, that's why there's huge importance on that fixture. We'd have been in a much more comfortable position had we done the job against Motherwell or done the United. Liam's smiling because he used a couple of cliches there. Nah, I mean, I actually missed them. Yeah, I'm still laughing at Harry calling them the Arabs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Usually you pick up like... the Gale cliches, but no. Uh, no, no, I missed all. Yeah, I mean, like, I like it dust them. ourselves down and go again. Like, oh, you know, oh, ah, it's oh, a big mate. one. Mate, I mean, Kem, uh, dust ourselves off and go down again. Sounds like a League One football player that's getting interviewed by Sky after the game. After he's just drawn one one with Accrington Stanley on a Tuesday night in the televised <laughs> game, and it's his well, first time he has to do media. It reminds me of when Victor Nietzsche when he was at Sunderland was told to tweet something and he's and he's copy and pasted the full thing like tweet something like and then that's what it reminded me of. What's worse? That's that'll be a few times, eh? Thanks yeah, to the should. fans for all your support we go again. You know, like, do, absolute uh... nonsense. <laughs> we should do a, 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 a an up the slope on uh, like social media gas. Remember when the Celtic uh, we were on Instagram posted I ordered yeah. the large fish. <laughs> I ordered the large fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Super oh, no. oh Christ! So um, good. Uh, we, we've had one last minute question come in. Not again, not particularly happy. Um, but um, <laughs> happy Hibby 01. We beat Hearts, guys. Where's all the good vibes going? Um, not particularly said... happy Hibby, do you mean? <laughs> 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 um, but Yaza asked, are they holding off on announcing a director of football in case we don't reach top six? Do you think that that's the reason why it's going quiet or do you think that it is a bit of a lengthier process than they initially pitched us? I don't think they still don't know who it's going to be, so take their time. It's a massive appointment, they've got to get it right, and I think they'll be doing all they can to search out the right candidate. And things change in football, people move on, people get jobs, people may get offered jobs. I think the like Ross Wilson, for example, leaving Rangers, I'm not saying that would have a direct impact on who we're looking for, but it might mean that there's people at Rangers who maybe been asked to hang around a little bit longer than they were initially. There might be other clubs as well where things change. So I think if you start a process in January and it's now, you know, coming up towards the end of April, you know, there's probably something that we've hit some hurdles in the road, I would imagine, along the way in appointing someone. Um, but it would be good to get someone in for the beginning of the transfer window because, as we've talked about, it's a massive, massive window with some of the really good low players expiring and us needing to fill some gaps in the squad that they're going to leave. Yeah, just to use a, a phrase that Greg coined, don't mind it. Um, I think it's good that all importance is placed on what's happening on the pitch at the minute towards the end of the season. So if it, if it doesn't happen till, till after the football's finished, I'm happy enough for that. Don't mind it. Can you give us a positive question to finish up on, Harry? Because I feel like this has been too, too low-key for a, a Derby one. I know, yeah. Um, I've got one, I've got one. I've got one. Oh, who's your oh, favorite? Right. Who's, who's your favorite character from Willy Wonka? 
<laughs> I'm, a, I'm a goose to school, but I love him. Eh? Oh, it's got to be Granda Joe, isn't it? Is that it's Granda Joe? That's his name, isn't it? I'm going to be honest. I don't think I've ever seen Charlie in the chocolate factory. <laughs> Ask you, and he'll fill you in. I don't think I've seen it. I, I had um, growing up as a kid, I had two VHSs. One of them was Fantasia, which I was fucking terrified. Does anyone see Fantasia? <laughs> <laughs> fucking terrifying it's like it's, people it's like now become like a cult famous thing because people uh, watch it when they're high oh is, god like, like really hallucinogenic so I had Fantasia was one of them and the other thing I had um, and uh, probably shouldn't be telling you this but uh, the other VHS I had was Pingu just loads and loads of episodes with Ping, Pingu on VHS and that's fueled my love for penguins now as a 30 oh. something year old man Fantasia and the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Greg. Greg, do the line. Yeah. What line? He said he was scared of a TV show. Are you not going to tell him to grow up? <laughs> what? Oh. No, no. I'm going to back the other one. Fantasia you know what? I, get scary, it, like. I get it because <clears throat> she went to a young guy and you watch these sort of things. It's really fucking scares the life out of you. Um, I didn't have as many scary VHS, to be honest. I had um, I had bananas and pyjamas. Ooh. What a show, by the way. What a oh, show. Sensational stuff, that. Be um, one and B2. What? B1 and B2. Banana 1 and Banana 2. Aye, by the way, what, what a programme. They probably changed it as well. I've no idea what we've... to fucking something else, but yeah. I, I didn't expect that the Derby special um, after us winning would result in Greg talking about bananas <laughs> and pyjamas. Um, but here we are, guys. Do we want to end can, up can, can another Can another hallucinogenic children's TV programme we're talking about? He's ever watched uh, the Magic Roundabout before. Oh, that, that's, 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 that, 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 that is for, uh, that's for people that are fucking absolutely off the chain. Now. <laughs> like, how are you showing that to children? Uh, Imagine then... being away with a goalie and watching that. Away with a goalie. <laughs> <laughs> You'd actually be hiding behind the couch. Oh. <clears throat> in the night garden as well it's just demented you get the wee guys and they're like mew, 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 and then they just walk off and it's like what, what what's just happened mew, mew, mew. <laughs> um, <laughs> alright guys do we want a, a Hibs question to end it on or just a general Aye. question Hibs alright Hibs, Hibs. Um, a player that we've not talked about in depth that impressed you at the weekend um, I'll I'll start I'll kick us off um, I think that Paul Hanlon, I know we mentioned Greg mentioned him earlier, but I I just thought for me, I thought Paul Hanlon was was absolutely brilliant. I think um we, we didn't look worried. Um if if you can go a whole game without looking worried, um and for me, Paul Hanlon was just kind of that monster in the box. Every time the ball went anywhere near the hips box, I just felt like Hanlon was there. And I felt that every time anyone went near him, he just stamped his authority. I think that sometimes physicality is something that we criticize Hanlon for. And Greg, how many um Crossfield balls did you tally? There was one in particular, I think, um, that went to Cadden in the second <clears> half, and it was it was gorgeous. He yeah. played two actually, noted them both down. He played one in the first half as well. Yeah, um, I actually thought he was very good. He was probably good. The, the player I spoke about, um, I've obviously questioned him more than any other Hibs fan in the world, to be honest. But I thought he was phenomenal. He, you know, he, he was a proper leader at the weekend. He even got involved and. In, <clears throat> sticking up for his teammates so yeah no, I thought an all round solid defensive performance plus had Gary Devlin's neck in his palm by full time so 10 out of 10 Paul superb mate keep it going what a gentleman what a gentleman Liam for yourself I can't even dodge with Kevin Nisbet we've recorded an hour long episode and no cut has mentioned <laughs> Kevin Nisbet who is everything that we criticised him for Really, mm-hmm. in the run up to the game, to be honest, was just, was there. His work great. Is it the effort? Is the goal, the finish? <clears throat> um, some of his link up play at various points. It just looked like we were playing a team and a system that really suited them. And I felt like I needed to give him some praise to counterbalance after you said he was uh, struggling last week, Harry, when he'd scored nine and twelve. Okay. <laughs> that was some uh, date, man. I yeah. don't know what was in that beer you were drinking on Thursday. Oh no, it, was, it, was, it wasn't what was in the beer, mate. It was the volume off the beers that was a problem that day, mate. Honestly, I was. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, I think um, I think you've probably seen a different side to Kevin as well, where he's backing into defenders and looking at when headers and, and take it down and lay it off. So it's good to see. I think I maybe I've criticised him the last couple of weeks for his effort, to be honest, especially against Motherwell, but can't criticise any part of his game at the weekend. No. And yourself, mate? 
I think there was a number of great performances, but it would probably be a bit remiss of me not to mention Paul Hanlon. I think he was an absolute colossal. Um, won his headers, won his tackles, never looked worried, never looked bothered, didn't come under any threat. And make no mistake, he's absolutely shot to bits and he's doing everything he can to get himself on that pitch to play for Hibs. He just loves the club. You know, I, I think it's understated how much he puts his body through in order to get through the games for us. And it makes a massive difference when he is on the pitch. We've seen that this season. We've looked a much better side when he's been in it. See, see the leadership thing about Hanlon. I mean, now he just put that to bed as well. You know, the thing about people not calling him a leader. Did you see uh-huh. how he reacted to various events that took place on Saturday? I mean, the one that stands mm-hmm. out is the incident with Cammy Devlin. But <clears throat> I also think his, he, he, his performance, he kind of he kind of led in his performance as well. He led by example and he done he done everything right. He made the right decisions at the right times. Faultless, okay. absolutely Clear. faultless. Mm. Clear. Yeah, I think I think this has probably been one of his best seasons for a while. Um, so yeah, like I've obviously criticised him enough, but I think credit where it's due, he's, he's, he's been absolutely superb for the club recently. Um, Can I just say, uh, Louis Stevenson was playing on Saturday as well. Harlan and Stevenson in the same team, yeah. and they were both really, really good. So there's another. Yeah, Louis Stevenson is thirty five year old and still screams at the yeah. linesman. So I don't mind it. <laughs> can, can I just? I, I I I had a horrible feeling that that may be Lewis Stevenson's potentially his last derby, potentially or, or his last derby at Easter Road. Yeah. Yep. Well, at least at least we won. So sad thought. Mm-hmm. Sad thought. Oh, again, I wasn't, again, wasn't, wasn't criticised him, but <laughs> you, you can't you can't fault fault his effort, his work rate. Um, that boy would slide tackle planes to be honest. Super. <laughs> there was one in the second half where there's three or four bodies and he's not asked what team they're on he's taken a lot so <laughs> got to respect it got and if, respect we're, if we're going on about club legends I mean uh, getting subbed off at Easter Road and getting clapped off is a, is a hard task these days but Andy Halliday getting his Andy Halliday <laughs> song as he's, getting, as he's walking off that was sensational <laughs> that was beautiful what a way it's to end his 100th it. performance for Hearts what a loser the, the Hibs photographer managed to catch him looking over at the celebrations as well of one of the photos. So, you know, he's, he always seems to pop up in the right areas. Oh. Well, and if I can pat myself on the back, that was an absolute genius tweet last night, which character of it deserved an end. And yeah. <laughs> um, but guys, uh, thank, thanks so much for joining. Um, oh, actually, actually, we've not done score predictions in ages. Let's, let's do score predictions for the weekend. What, what are we thinking? I like a score prediction. Nobody Liam's cares. giving me a disgusted look. Greg doesn't care. Ryan, what is your score prediction? Arse clenching 1 0 Hibs. <laughs> Greg? Sweaty, sweaty, sweaty 1 0 win. It's not going to be pretty. Who else is 1 0? I, I, I don't want to predict anything else. It was, it was out of my mouth already. I think it'll be 1 0. I think it'll be very similar to the game at the end of uh, the beginning of the season. I'll call it 2 0 Hibs. 2 0 Hibs. Won the cabbage. Um, but yes, guys. On that happy note, see, when was the last time we predicted four wins? Eh? Probably not very we do it every week, no matter how shite we are, Harry. I know, I know. <laughs> that, to be, it's sometimes this season, we've done a few draws in there as well, to be fair. Mm. Not the way to the old forum, but we always predict wins, man. Ah, uh, yeah. And even away to the old forum. Oh, we've got to beat them at some point. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, thanks so much uh, for listening to our ramblings about the mighty cabbage. Great win at the weekend, and we really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, guys. See ya. Go on the cabbage. Take care. Bye. Bye.